Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Depending on where you are joining us from. Welcome to the third episode of our STP training webinar series in 2020. We started our year with the hottest topic on the technology front of late, artificial intelligence, and the topic for our second webinar was ROI on test automation, which was just as critical considering that the whole world today is uh, rushing towards automation. and today we are going back to ai very specifically for testing so the title for our talk today is the state of ai for testing our guest speaker joining us on the webinar is jennifer bonine i am smita mishra i am a tester myself and a sustainability enthusiast too i'm excited to host you all and jennifer on our stp webinars incidentally jennifer is also our keynote speaker for the upcoming conference Spring 2020 STPCon which is coming up at San Diego from March 30th to 2nd of April and Jennifer did you get a chance to go through it and any particular exciting talks that you got to attend that you share what you are going to talk about Yeah, I'm really excited about this event. I love attending it, and I think this year, being that we're in San Diego, is really exciting. It's going to be a great venue for this event for everyone. Um, there's a couple of things I'm really interested in. So, um, I saw a session on getting your developers to think like QA. So I'm I'm interested to see that. Um, and there's a great lineup again of different folks that I always enjoy, as well as some new faces that I haven't had a chance to see before. So um, I'm looking forward to some of the sessions around um, being more agile without doing agile with Don Haynes. Um, there's some other sessions about. um ai as you mentioned it's a hot topic i always like listening to other folks who are in this space on what they're thinking about and what they're doing in the space so i'm i'm really excited about those as well i think again it's going to be a great opportunity the lineups incredible um mike lyle came out with a new book recently i'm excited to see him again talk about that um there's some discussion on influence of ai around race culture um diversity and bias that's also a passion of mine so i'm excited to see that as well and what are you going to talk about i have a i have a couple of sessions so um leadership iq one of the things i'm talking about is as our technology changes as our roles change as the future of work is evolving and changing for all of us um what types of skills we need as leaders um to stay up and um be productive efficient and then remove roadblocks for our teams and make them as productive as we can and efficient and supported in their careers so we've seen a, a lot of technological change which means a lot of changes in how teams function and operate what the role of the leader is in those teams so the session i'm doing will be a lot around um that and what it's going to mean to the future of leadership for those folks that are leaders in their career and now that doesn't mean that you have direct reports um you can lead from different places in the organization so we talk about how you lead and influence from different roles inside the organization and then um i have a new keynote that i'm doing that i'm really excited about that is studies on what's made high power impactful teams in some of the most um innovative impactful teams in the world so we'll be bringing some of that data to bear about what's been the most um impactful trends and things to do for leaders what's worked well what's caused some challenges and where people have seen some failures in teams when they're trying to innovate so i'm really excited about that new keynote um as well that we'll be doing and then i'm of course talking about ai so um shifting to ai as an approach in your teams and how you do that as you mentioned um hot topic right now in the industry so a couple of different fun things that we'll be talking about so i hope everyone listening can make it um and tunes in and heads to san diego cuz who doesn't want to be in san diego in the spring <laughs> very well said i've seen you speak earlier at stp con in past quite a few times 
And of course, you're again going there to not only do your talk and workshop, but also as a keynote. What are your highlights that keep, that, you know, keep you bringing back to the event? So um, one of the things we try and do is get perspective um, from different teams, different leaders, um, myself and the other folks at Pink Lion, we engage with um, probably on an average week, it's just crazy. On an average week, we're probably engaging with three to 10 different teams across the world around what they're doing, approaches, how they're doing it. So what we like to bring to those events is just that, that broader perspective. Um, we just were at the World Economic Forum in Davos in Switzerland that brought over, you know, 100 countries together. You know, you've got people from all over the world talking about what's top of mind. You mentioned being a sustainable enthusiast. One of the things we're doing is trying to interject the sustainable development goals that the UN came up with. And one of the hottest topics right now is what they're calling the fourth industrial revolution, which is AI, blockchain, you know, IoT, all these different technologies, they believe that our sustainable development goals that the UN set for the world by 2030, over 70% of those can be achieved if all of us working in technology in spaces like AI and blockchain and security start focusing on these things. There are things like gender equality in the workforce. They're about future of work. They're about innovation. They're about poverty. They're about all these different pieces. And um, one of the things we're bringing back, we're starting to really talk about is the role of technology companies in those sustainable development goals and creating sustainability in our world and our responsibility in the technology space in that. So this year, that's one of the things that I think as a company, Pink Lion is really enthusiastic about, as well as we're starting to talk about how to inject the next younger generation into innovation. So we're partnering with an organization called Dream Tank, which allows young entrepreneurs um, in different states where they actually allow kids to own their own companies in the US at least um, that are related to sustainable development goals, how we're getting that mindset because children are much more open to new things and new technologies. So working with kids to influence and help give them the skills they need. Well, we do look forward to seeing you there again, Jennifer. And uh, on that note, attendees, um, let me remind you, you can avail the early bird pricing until 14th of February, which means you have just two more days to avail these. Uh, then there are discounts for teams and alumni registrations. And the best part is these discounts can be combined together. And that means you get to save really big. For any further queries with respect to sponsoring, attending, or team registrations, etc., send an email to info at softwaretestpro.com and visit the conference site stpcon.com for all the details. All right, so let's get started, Jennifer, with the webinar. Welcome again. We are very excited to have you with us today. And let me quickly introduce you for all of us here. Jennifer Bonine, she's the CEO of PinkLion.ai. She's a well-known speaker, teacher, and trainer at both national and international conferences. She has keynoted numerous testing, agile, and development conferences. Jennifer's belief is that we should do what we are passionate about and believes in living your passion. To this end, Jennifer co-founded and is the CEO of Pink Lion AI, which is a breakout AI company. She's also the first female AI testing tech CEO and is currently collaborating in the entertainment, gaming, media, and professional sports industries with Test.ai. Jennifer is also a founding sponsor and member of AI Girls and supporter of Lead the Way to give children in hospitals needed uh, distractions and technology solutions. So now let's start learning and understanding the state of AI in testing with Jennifer. Uh, so the floor is all yours now. Perfect, thanks Meta, for that amazing introduction and thank you for allowing um, us to be here today. We're really excited about this. I wanna quick introduce one other individual who will be weighing in and helping me during this webinar. So as Smita mentioned, um, Pink Lion was founded with three individuals, myself, Rick Felice and Andrew Burkholz. Rick is with me, he is our chief operating officer. Um, and does and is responsible for delivery of all of our engagements. So Rick will be on the line as well, as Smita mentioned, um, to weigh in and then at the end answer any questions you guys have that we didn't get to. 
So we also, I put up my email, it's jennifer at pinklion.ai. If you have questions as well, we're always happy um, to take questions. One of our main goals um, in what we do is just education and helping people understand what AI is, what it isn't, um, where it plays a role and what it does in the space around both AI and machine learning. So we're passionate about that as a team. Um, Smitha did our introduction. One of the things we do wanna use right now, because what's interesting about these webinars, unlike the conferences where we're all gonna get to sit face to face, is you guys are there, but I don't get to see you. So I always like to do something a little interactive. So we're gonna try this. If you could do me a favor, um, I'm sure a lot of you have cell phones, right? So most of us have those, those mobile devices that stay very close to us at all times. So if you just go on your um, cell phone or on your computer to www.menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I, and it's on the screen right now, you'll be able to answer some polling questions that we asked throughout the session. This helps us, Rick and I, understand um, where you're coming from, what your roles are, and target the information more specifically to all of you. So if you go to www.menti.com, you'll be able to work along with us and answer some of these questions. It's gonna be pretty simple. All you're gonna do once you get to that site, you'll see that it asks you for a six digit code. We're gonna give you those codes. You put the code in and you're able to respond. It's that simple. You don't need to sign up for an account. You don't need to do anything. But what we found is when you engage and interact, you take more and you learn more from the sessions you're involved in. So we want you to get as much out of this as you can, being that you're giving us a valuable hour of your day today. So please go to menti.com if you haven't already, and then we will be using some online polling for you guys as we go through this. So let's get started. We're gonna do a warm up poll. You'll see the code there. I'm gonna click it, don't worry, the code will come back up again, but your code is 96 three two one four so if you're on menti.com go to nine six three two one four and you'll be able to answer our first warm-up polling question and this one is just to get you guys started we want to be able to um just see kind of this first question so it's going to pull up here you'll be able to see your fellow audience participants responding as we start to respond so again nine six three two one four um, all you need to do this for this warm up question is who would you rather have lunch with? We've got Elon Musk, Tim Burton, Michelle Obama, your mom, Angelina Jolie. We'll kind of see where people are weighing in this Wednesday morning, how we're feeling here. Oh, Michelle Obama's in the lead right now. Very close to Elon Musk, right? All right. Wow, Michelle really took a big lead there. So it's kind of fun. Thank you for everyone joining in. Um, again, for those of you that are just joining us, we're doing a few polling questions. You just go to that website at the top, www.menti.com, and use the code. Perfect. This is just getting you warmed up, guys. It's Wednesday. So um, for some of you, it's late night. If you're in, in Asia um, regions, if you're in the U.S., it might be earlier for you. So good job. It's good to know we've got a lot of folks awake this morning. Um, so again, just menti.com. All right. Wow, Elon Musk just edged out Michelle barely. So, <laughs> all right, perfect. I will give it like another two seconds. I'm gonna go now to your next question. So we've got 100 respondents already, that's great. Um, Elon Musk pulled ahead there. The second question we're gonna have, just so we can tell again for the webinar, is what is your current role in your organization? Some of you already went on to that. So you can see in this word bubble, the bigger words are the things that are most prevalent. So tester and test seem to be the biggest um, responses. We've got some QA managers that looks pretty large as well. Um, someone answered Elon Musk. That's great that he joined um, our webinar today. So I think we might've been on the last question. Um, perfect, so QA managers, lots of managers, we've got some engineers, this just tells you kind of who we've got on this webinar, which is kind of fun, because right now there's about 180 of you listening in on this, you get to feel a little more connected to the folks on the phone to know what everybody's doing. Okay, so we've got some directors, some different roles here. 
So what we'll do is we'll take this, Rick and I, from the approach of a very diverse team, a um, few different sets of roles, and kind of give you um, some education that fits these diverse roles and kind of how you see the world and your organization. Okay, good job, guys. Um, you did great on that. So here's what we're going to cover today. What is AI really? So what is it? How do we leverage it in our technology teams and for testing? What problems it actually helps us solve? Um, in the end, we'll talk a little bit more about how we see this impacting jobs, because that's always a big question of what does this do to my job and what am I going to do when there's more of this in the world? And then we're going to give you guys some tools at the end. So stick with us to the end, because we're going to give you some um, links and some free sites for you to actually get more education and learn on your own because again as Muna mentioned in our introduction pink lions a lot about just educating individuals and giving you the knowledge you need to make good choices around what you're doing in your teams and your organizations and then we'll leave a few minutes for questions so rick and i'll go through this in time to get some of those questions out that i know you guys probably all have once we get through it so what is ai really um, we want to first talk about what artificial intelligence is and what machine learning is because they're two different things and the key to starting this process is really understanding when you're hearing things what is artificial intelligence and then what is the scope of machine learning which is mainly what we're using and seeing in our world around the impact for testing and technology teams is that machine learning component um, of what's being leveraged to help and assist in what we're doing every day. So um, when we just look at a pure definition and people dispute everything all the time, but um, just a level set from our perspective, how we look at this is it's demonstrated by machines in contrast to the national natural intelligence we have as humans. So artificial intelligence could be basically anything smart that's being done by a machine as opposed to a human or that appears to have some level of smart built into the machine that you're actually leveraging and using. Rick, anything you want to add into our world of what is AI? Uh, yeah, actually a little bit. Um, AI itself, everybody kind of hears that and it's an always an interesting response when we talk about the fact that we build AI and we work with it every day. Um, and it's one of, some people go immediately to, you know, the, the what the movies do and the con concept of like general AI where we have sentiment machines that are trying to take over the world in the Doomsday Apocalypse movies that they put out. Um, and that's way off in the distant future. That's not relevant. Um, what we do now is called narrow AI. And narrow AI is, it is a thinking brain that's been given a single goal, and its job is really to accomplish that goal. So the self-driving cars, for instance, that's an AI. It's a narrow-minded AI. Its goal is to, to navigate the roads safely and not crash the car or hit anything. Uh, whereas a generic or a, a ge general AI would be that car standing up and being a transformer. So there would be kind of the two definitions. So people get really nervous about the that general one. That's not here. Don't worry. Bots are not coming to enslave us and take over the world. We are not there yet. Perfect. And then when we talk about machine learning in contrast to what Rick just described, right? So machine learning is actually a field of computer science like it's it's a lot about math right so it uses statistical techniques and math to give computer systems the ability to quote learn with data without being explicitly programmed so when we're talking about machine learning and the algorithms that go into that and the neural networks that's where we're feeding it data so this is where you hear about bias and people start talking about what's the impact of bias in artificial intelligence what they're really talking about is that statistical data and when you think about historical and statistical data these are things that we've collected and gathered and data is what it is right so if we've had biased data in and data sets in our past or how we've operated say for example ai and machine learning is computing the, the likelihood someone will reoffend by looking at hundreds of thousands of cases or even tens of thousands of court cases, they're using actual data to give that result. And if that data was biased, say our court system was biased and the way that they brought judgment was biased, and then we feed that into our machine learning algorithm, that inherent data then is what's being used to get the result. So that's why now as we're using more machine learning, people are talking about the need for 
for um, controlling the bias, testing the AI itself, doing some other things around the machine learning and the algorithms we're using and the data that we're feeding in to those systems. Rick, anything to add on the machine learning piece of it? Well, I can talk machine learning for a long time. It's math and that's what I love. <laughs> Um, really, you can break it down to there's three different level or di different types of machine learning. There's supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Um, they all have their own specifics and their own benefits, and, and it's really about kind of figuring out what's best for what you're, the goal you're trying to accomplish and how you have time to actually train the data that you're trying to train it on. Um, one, one example of bias that I know was in just recently kind of out uh, well, it wasn't didn't make big news, but it was out there was Google had realized that their search algorithm they were using uh, They had people classifying the links and the sites of new sites into their system and they had hired primarily people from the Midwest and So they were just getting an, an, an unknown biased about people in the Midwest just tend to you know I'm, I live in the Midwest myself there I live in a city where there's a giant retail company right in my backyard, and I, I naturally have a bias to shop there over other retails just because it's a local company. Um, and that's the type of bias we're talking about. It can be these very subtle things like that um, where you need to just start looking at grabbing people from all over the world and all over uh, different demographics, dim different backgrounds, all of it to try to help keep that bias in check because it's not bias that we think of in like political or things like that. It, it can be something as simple as I like the color red slightly more than I like the color blue. The bots will pick up on that and then they will inherently start liking things like that or based on your learning style. So again, key just to understand artificial intelligence versus machine learning um, and what that is. So the way I think of things is I was in pictures. So if we were to look at a bubble and we said, the bubble is AI. Machine learning is a subset inside that bubble of AI that Rick talked about with the different types of artificial intelligence that exist out there. And then even inside machine learning, there's different types of machine learning, as Rick mentioned. But think of it as AI is the bigger piece. Machine learning is a subset that's inside of artificial intelligence when you're hearing those words um, that makes that up. So that's the first piece is just kind of level set on what that is. Now, we've not, this is nothing new. So artificial intelligence and machine learning has been around for a long time. Um, there have been studies going on in universities. There have been obviously companies like IBM and others looking at these strategies and techniques since the 80s. And if we think about that now, um, some of us may remember the 80s and were alive them. Some of you may have not even been alive in the 80s, but that's like 40 years ago. So it's not brand new to talk about this, but what's really changing and what, why we're now looking at fourth industrial revolution is what's happening is with scale and accuracy, we're seeing more capability to actually apply this to day-to-day -day learnings of what we're doing. So what's happening is we've got more advanced neural networks that we can use. We've also got more access to compute at cheaper prices. So the cost of compute has actually decreased which is what is also helping spur along lots of innovation in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we now don't house this just inside large corporations or big companies. There's a lot of startups and innovation happening because the access to compute and the maturity of those neural networks over the last 40 years. So that's why this is becoming a very hot topic right now for all of us as the next industrial revolution and what we're going to see in this space. The next piece is if we look at some of the experts out there who have been dealing with this for a long time. So NVIDIA. So if you look at the CEO of NVIDIA, he's saying, and we've heard this before, that software is eating the world. So if we think about software, all of us interact with software all the time and all the products that we leverage. So retail companies, our service provider companies, our banks, just about everything we do has a technology component that leverages software. So we've started to say over time, every company has a software component and could almost be classified as a company that runs and is dependent on its software. So what we said was software is eating the world, but now AI will eat that software. So it is the trend and where everything is moving. People will argue about, is it now? Is it two years from now? When is it? But it's coming. And it is something that all these executives are saying is going to take over our space. One of the things we look at is basically the formula X plus AI, with X being every job. 
And there's studies going on right now to look at, depending on what your job function is, how long it takes before artificial intelligence is a bigger component and plays a daily role in your function or your job. So what they're saying is all jobs will have a component of AI in them in our future. It's just dependent on what industry you're in, dependent on what job function you're in, when that's gonna be a piece for you. So just setting the stage again, these are experts. Now we all know, let's bring this into problems we have that it helps with in testing or testing our products that we're using. So this is a survey by Gartner. So Gartner went out and looks at every year what's gonna be game changing for organizations and companies and they survey these folks. So over 2000 folks were asked at sea level positions all over the world, what do you expect to be your game changers for your organization? The number one response was artificial intelligence and machine learning. So these are strategies that all of our organizations are looking at from a technology perspective on how to help change the game and put us ahead of our competitors. The second thing people are saying is data analytics and predictive analytics. Hand in hand with AI, what we're seeing is that artificial intelligence and machine learning produces vast amounts of data and information that we have to deal with. Because of that data, those two things are so tightly coupled that it's changing a lot of jobs to becoming more data science driven so you hear the stats and how many more data scientists are getting added into technology teams and testing teams. This is why, because as you start to use more artificial intelligence and machine learning, you need those skills to be able to actually analyze information, use data to help predict patterns in what's happening so that you can make better decisions in your products and your technology. So those two things go really hand in hand. And then I think it's really interesting to see the big, difference between AI and data analytics is what people are saying is game changers to the next closest one, which would be cloud, right? So just looking at cloud computing and what that does for us, and then IoT and the others kind of falling from there. But there is a pretty good gap between where people really think the game changers will be as we look to the future here. Then in testing, what we see is there's a fundamental problem for us in general, right? So there is too much to do in terms of um, coverage and complexity. There's an increasing complexity that's grown in all of our lives around what we're testing and trying to cover for our consumers, and we don't have enough time. Speed to market, really important. All of us have been looking for years and years at Agile, DevOps, anything to help accelerate our pace so we have this inherent problem of we've got a ton of complexity because of all the tech in the world and we don't have enough time to cover all of that technology so how do we solve that that's why companies have started looking at machine learning as a way to be an assistant to helping solve the testing coverage problem and you're seeing more of it one of the things this also assists with Many of us who've been in testing or the profession of testing products and applications have seen it's historically hard to understand the interconnectivity of the systems. We don't have good requirements documents. We don't have good documentation. One of the things artificial intelligence assists with is providing app graphs and visualization of the connected nature of the different websites and mobile apps that we have in our organizations to close that gap of what are the requirements? How does everything map together? How do they look and work together cohesively? And how do we get a picture of what's changed in that space. So I'll let Rick talk just a little bit about how this maybe impacts us and what the app graphs do. So the way the app graph works is when the bot goes out, it will start looking at what it can see and it will start identifying different pieces of the website and finding objects throughout the page. And so what it will do, for example, this one here is Chewy, the dog food um, or dog toy store, pet store. Um, and it identifies that, hey, there's a shopping cart in the corner and I know what a shopping cart is. Once it sees a shopping cart, it then it says that there's a high probability this is some form of a retail app. And because of that, there should be some sort of a product page where I can filter and sort. There should be some sort of a cart that I can put products in. I should be able to then, you know, just like we would when we go to a retail site, what our general expectations of a generic website are. Then it goes through and it will just start to go through and click all the objects and build what you see over there to the left, which is the app graph. And that's for the bot to understand how to navigate around and how the links all can, or all the pages all connect to each other. 
And inside of that, this is a multi-layer table. And like I said before, I love math and we can go down deep dive into that if you want to go into K learning um, and how it finds the links that actually connect those lines and whatnot. But along the way, then it, it has then basically a roadmap <clears throat> of how to get through your application. And once it knows how to get through your application, when you give it an objective, for instance, to go validate the sort page, it will know exactly how to go in and get to that page and then do the validation. So it's changing how we conceptualize testing in such a big way, because instead of having to write step-by-step-by-step -step -step guides for standard classic Selenium automation, we now can simply say, go to this page and validate this one thing. And then if the application changes or anything outside of it, it updates the app graph and we don't have to change any test cases. We don't have to do anything. The bot actually will just go and still continue to test. So that's where it's starting. To, that's the really that AI first kind of mindset and changing how we plan, strategize, and execute our tests. Perfect. And then I know there might be questions on this. So as we get to the end, write down your questions. Rick and I will answer more questions on what this does. But this is a game changer for shifting that mindset of intent-based testing using AI first to drive how and what you're doing from a testing perspective and where you're going. So one of the other things we know from the studies and why this is impactful is it's a key testing challenge is it used to be about detecting defects. So again, a lot of us, our job for testing and QA, the priority was, can we detect defects before going live and releasing to production? For the first time ever in the World Quality Report, what we saw was that it wasn't about detecting issues from a C-level perspective. What they really want to have happen is they want end user satisfaction. So those app score, the store, the scores for your app in the app stores like the Google Play Store and the Apple Store, much more important to executives than just the number of defects in your backlog. They want to know do your consumers and customers who actually use your stuff every day, be it a website, an app, a product, whatever, are they okay with what you're building and producing? And that's more important. So that's where AI helps us and really focuses is end user satisfaction and looking at things from the vantage point of that end consumer and how they're seeing and feeling about the products that they're engaging and interacting with. Other challenges that we are starting to see some real advancement in where this is helping is competitive comparisons. So I will show you a chart of how AI can actually show you comparisons for your competitors this is starting to help drive product decisions. So by looking at some of the sentiment analysis that AI provides and machine learning provides, you can start making product decisions. It really helps with that scale problem of you can't cover all the devices and all the things. Artificial intelligence now and machine learning algorithms can run on anything with a screen for some of the ones that exist out there today. So it provides that scale. It also gives you that speed. So it just reasonably can perform faster than we can as a human um, and can go through more more um, versions of devices, more environments, more everything that we can get through in the same amount of time. It also can run against our production environments to give us another layer of risk mitigation in production. And then it can test using data for different scenarios. So lots of flexibility to eliminate testing fatigue that all of us can get from banging the same scenario multiple times with different sets of data. So any of you who have done testing a long time understand testing fatigue, where say you've been testing this feature for the last week or two, and you run it over and over again in different scenarios, we naturally stop seeing some of the things when we look at the same problem over and over again. It's like those emails we write and then send out. We didn't see the issue, but someone else catches the misspelling or whatever when we send it out because we looked at it too much, but a fresh set of eyes sees it. What happens with a bot and a computer is it's always predictable. It goes and it does the same thing every time. So it doesn't have that testing fatigue that the rest of us get when we look at something over and over again. Not to mention that when we're under pressure, we have tight deadlines and timelines to deliver. We get tired, like physically tired. If you've been working a 12, 14 hour day, looking at the same stuff, pushing to get a release out the door, we just get exhausted the bots can keep cranking and help us and assist with this. So I look at this as a really good thing as something to help me. I think of bots as my virtual assistant. So 
how I think of it as, you know, when we want to leverage this, I want to have a virtual research assistant that we're not talking about bots taking over, as Rick said, the world and they do everything. What we're really talking about starting to leverage in companies and organizations is how do I get these virtual research assistants to run and crank through large sets of information, lots of environments, lots of form factors, lots of different OSs, lots of different devices, and then bring back that data and information I need to be able to do my job better as a tester. So giving me what I need to be more effective in my job, right? I always say I could use as many virtual assistants as I can get because I have too much work and not enough time. And that's really what it's about. This is another study we saw from Gartner. So this isn't just Rick and I saying this, but they're saying there's real benefits in the studies of what's happening using AI augmented development and using artificial intelligence and machine learning and development teams. It promotes and enforces consistency. A bot will train and run the same in every environment on every team if you want it to. So it creates a lot of consistency in what's being done. It can detect and isolate weak points very quickly. It can just crank through large volumes of scenarios and data, again, much faster than we can. So again, if you think about just in a profession like a judge that sits and hears cases, in a judge's tenure on the bench, they maybe can hear, let's call it a couple hundred cases, just for sake of argument. They'll hear a couple hundred cases and look at a couple hundred scenarios, or even a doctor can only see how many patients, but a bot can actually crawl through cases of you know, tens of thousands of patients and tens of thousands of cases um, of, for judges and look at patterns in that data. So it can detect weak points and isolate in larger mass volumes of data than we can look at as humans. It can go faster than we can. It just physically can multi-thread and crank through more things than we as a human can. It doesn't sleep. It doesn't stop to eat. It doesn't have tiny humans, as I call them. It doesn't have a personal life. So it just has this crank through capability to give us intelligent information that we then leverage as humans to make decisions. It gives us product, um, oversight. It, it gives us insight into what things are happening, where things are breaking, patterns in behavior. And they can also help know when we're making changes in our development, where those things are not working as well and giving us some patterning in that. So there are definitely some things that even Gartner and other um, resources that do studies on this type of thing are saying, absolutely, this has value and it is working um, for companies and providing value to them. The other thing we know is that businesses are using this, whether we like it or not. 59% of companies say that they're focusing on predictive analytics using artificial intelligence in this next year. 45% already use some form of intelligent automation. So again, not just coded automation, but some type of intelligent automation in their systems. This could be chat bots that are smart. It could be other things as well, but almost 45%, right? That's a pretty big number of companies already using intelligent automation. And then there's really just a small fraction of companies that doesn't support using AI or optimizing quality using AI, it's a small number. So most companies are looking at this, it is something people are going to do. Now, what you're seeing here is one use case or example. There's lots of use cases of where this works. Um, before, what used to happen in the cruise line industry was if you wanted to test technology on a ship, now, think about any of you who have been on a cruise before. When you're on a ship, it's a different physical network. That network operates in the middle of the ocean, right? It goes different places. It operates on ship time versus physical land time. There's lots of differentiators in that. So if you want to run technology on a ship, you physically have to have someone on that ship to be able to see what's actually happening in that system. So what you want to do is be able to have something that allows you, as you're seeing here on the right, to run all of these over 200 portals and screens that operate on a ship and do it all the time for you to check that they're working and functioning properly in the middle of the ocean. So a good way that instead of having to pile tens of humans on a ship to physically test things on that ship that operate that you can't replicate on land, if we think about cruise ships, their optimal time is to be out in the water with passengers making money versus in dock 
being updated and upgraded with their technology. So there's very little time for cruise ship companies to be able to do what they need to do with technology and upgrades on the physical ship. Not to mention, this allows people now, the capability that work in the IT teams and the technology teams, not to be away from their families all the time, sitting on cruise ships. While it may sound fun for about a week, I'm telling you, after a couple of weeks on a cruise ship, we all would wanna come home um, and be on land again and not have to do that. So huge game changer in that industry. Another game changer is what we're seeing in literally the gaming industry. So yesterday, you know, before we had this technology that ran, people had to physically manually test games. There wasn't a way to use Selenium, Appium, any of the traditional automation tools to hook into either the Unity, the Unreal, or a custom gaming platform. You had to manually do that. So if you fundamentally change the game, there was one recently where they went in and redid all of the maps. So they basically went to a black hole for two days, reemerged with all new maps. All of us that are in automation know that if that had been hard coded in um, traditional based automation, because all that code changed in the background, you would have had to redo all of that automation to make it work when the game reemerged. Rick can tell us if Rick's done, hopefully he's not coughing. When we did this using AI, how long Rick it took to actually come back online after the game had come back up with a new map? Uh, it took us, I don't know, I, I think it was a couple hours to get the map updated and then there was just some small tweaks. Um, so it, it was within, I would say within four days, we were 100% again, just because we had some outliers, we had to get the bots too on the outskirts. So. And then Rick, because you build a lot of traditional automation, how long would that have taken if you had to rewrite all that traditional automation on that game, if it was even possible? Well, now you're just trying to give me a headache. Like if it was. Um, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, it would have been, I mean, that honestly, to get everything back at that level, it would have been six to nine months minimum just to be viable again. The entire terrain. If it would have even, yeah, yeah, if it would have even worked, right? Because games don't run traditional automation, but hypothetically, that's the difference here. That's why we talk speed, scale, all that type of stuff with these technologies. And this is stuff we haven't seen before. So a lot of people say this this stuff doesn't exist, it absolutely does. You just have to be at these events, conferences, seeing that new technology is emerging every single day. Now, before we talked about what AI does for us um, in terms of giving us real results quickly, this was actually done on a site. Um, it's not hooked into the DOM or the code. So again, with AI, we're not hooking into the code base in the back end of your system. So you can change all that. You can go from Java to JavaScript to whatever you want, frankly don't care, doesn't matter. AI looks at it visually like you and I view the screen. So it can go in and figure out what's happening. Even if you change all of that stuff in the back end, it's gonna go and try and figure it out if you give it a goal, if you give it an intent of what you want it to do. So this gives you um, an example of what we get from a result. So in this case, if we tell it, add a shoe to cart, It'll show you screen caps of what it did. It'll show you how long it took to get through each screen. It'll show you what gesture it did to get there. So you're getting that type of data back to the data and information when you're leveraging AI and you're testing. Now, besides screen captures, they also, a lot of them, give you a video. So again, if it's a tool that's robust, it should give you a video and it should give you screen captures. Now, all of us remember when you used to have to write defects manually, what's beautiful about this, it's a laser pointer for engineers and developers of what happened both before something that um, failed or was unexpected and after. So you get that information to laser point to right where it is without having to reproduce or give all the steps or write it down. It's doing that for you so that you get that information from your virtual assistant and your bot. The other thing we talked about was industry comparisons. So this is Adidas, Nike, and Under Armour. It can give you, you can run the same bot on Adidas, Nike, Under Armour on those sites and get information that gives you a sample industry comparison. Now the industry comparison goal we gave it here was tell us how many steps it takes to add a shoe to a cart. For those of you watching, you probably can pick something out as testers right away um, about what the outlier is in this scenario, right? It's pretty easy to see that there's one of these things that's much different than the others, right? And that's good information for product managers to know. What I would argue is by using artificial intelligence and machine learning in our testing, it's giving testers and quality teams insights to help drive product decisions 
for product managers, developers, business, other people in the organization. So super useful to have this information, right? It tells us how long it took. It tells you the load on the system, the CPU, lots of stats. These are just examples. But this scenario, to get three industry comparisons, under two hours to run all these sites. So again, when we think about, do we have time to even run the stuff we need on our own stuff, let alone do an industry compare of a competitor, today that's hard to do, but something you could reasonably do when you start leveraging these types of technologies and testing. We mentioned gaming. So Rick, maybe you wanna weigh in real quick on why this works on gaming and why it um, works different than say your traditional coded automation. Yeah, um, so in gaming, they, they use these little things, these engines, like the Unity engine and the Unreal there on the screen to actually build the, it's it's a multi-layered platform, which is how you can get that animation and three, like rotational animation and things like that to happen. Um, and the problem with that is those objects never actually stop moving, which is why classic automation tools can't find them. There is no actual DOM for it to grab onto. The DOM has a like an Unreal icon and that's it. Um, so there's just the, the classic automation really struggles to identify stuff. And with AI and doing it the way we're doing it, we're using computer vision to actually slice and dice up the screen. So it's looking at the actual screen, not the back end, and saying what looks like an object, what looks like a pro, some a link, what looks like a text field, and then it's classifying it based on its own knowledge. And we can come back in and actually make changes and help it learn. And then it makes decisions based on the fact like, be my account button, it would then know this is probably taking me to an account page where I can have settings um, and change some of the testing. So again, if you have questions on this, we'll take those shortly here as we get to the end. Um, now the big question, will AI take jobs away? And I'll let Rick weigh in on this too. Um, but what I would say from the perspective and vantage point of where we sit, it's really just going to do what we've always seen in our industry, which is shift a little bit about the tasks we focus on and where we focus on as humans. Things that I see as really critical as we shift more to virtual assistants and AI taking a broader role for us and our teams and our organizations is creative thinking, problem solving skills, um, you know, using logic and thought around the AI testing the logic of the AI to make sure that the data we entered and have and are using is accurate, that the training is being done correctly, um, that if there is bias inside of it, that we're recognizing that. So my perspective is this is starting to shift the future of work. It is starting to shift what our jobs will look like. It is starting to shift the skills that we need um, to be able to do our jobs effectively. Looking at things like um, data analysis, how to analyze information in data, how to draw conclusions from that data, all going to be things that we see becoming more and more prevalent in our industry, which again leads me back to this is why it is so important more than ever to stay up and keep educated on what is changing, have resources to leverage on how to get information on what's changing, because it will shift You know what we're doing and the tasks we're doing. Rick, anything you wanted to add on that? No, nothing. You hit it really well. These not going to take jobs. Just create new ones and adjust the current ones. Yeah, perfect. And then we mentioned we would give you guys before we left some um, some tools and some places to go to get more information if you're curious to learn more um, besides here and other places. Audacity, um, a couple of other ones here. These are some good ones. Stanford has some courses. I would say just get information and obviously if you came to the webinar you were curious and interested. So these are three resources I would recommend um, taking a look at to get some more information for yourselves on um, where it's going, what's out there and what's available um, to you and what's coming. So I think um, that was all we had for our webinar. We wanted to leave some time for um, folks if you had questions, Smita, if that's okay. Um, so we can, we can turn to questions now with the last few remaining minutes to make sure we get um, some of the top of mind things maybe answered that people may have. Hey, uh, yes, Jennifer, first of all, thank you so much for such an insightful session on AI and especially from a tester's perspective on how AI could actually support testing. So thank you for the session. Uh, we do have quite a few questions and let me just start with them. So the first question is, how do you see the integration of AI and Selenium playing out in terms of open sourcing? 
Um, yeah, so there has been some work already. Um, I was just actually looking at some of the stuff again. There was an effort between Test AI, Jason Arbon, and Jonathan Lips to um, do some things between um, an open source piece of Test AI's technology and some of the work that they're doing in Appium in particular, but also there's going to be more, I think, in that space. What I do see today is that just like with when we had manual testing and then automation, traditional automation record replay automation came in and then Selenium and open source technologies. Um, this is just another component. So for a long time, I do see the interplay of this isn't a either or, like I, you, if you have Selenium, you won't have AI, or if you have AI, you won't have Selenium. These two things work nicely together. And I think that as we go forward, we're gonna see more and more interplay of those um, technologies together, but they definitely can coexist. We have organizations we work with that are definitely deeply embedded in their Selenium frameworks. We've built Selenium frameworks. We know how to hook those in. So they definitely can work together in tandem in your organization nicely. And it's not a, you know, you need one or the other. I don't know, Rick, anything else you want to add to that? You've built both. We'll go on to the next one, but yeah, no, I yeah. They definitely work together. We haven't seen a ton of, um, just because, so again, what AI relies on different than Selenium and other open source tools is a lot of it has to do with the neural net and the neural net has to be trained. Um, a lot of those neural net frameworks are very proprietary to the organizations that build them. It is their differentiator of where you see differences in accuracy of um, what the results are coming out of those um, tools. We have worked with large organizations. Um, one's very colorful and is a search engine, and another one is a large ERP system. Both of those companies and, and organizations have chosen to buy versus build on the AI just because building AI from scratch takes a lot of years. So if you look at the leading companies and we look across AI platforms at all the companies and the technologies, it's taken them, it's not like overnight you all, all of a sudden have a mature neural net. You're talking years and years of training and many, many websites, apps, training data that goes into this to make it mature. Um, so it's it's um, highly proprietary in that regard. Plus, a lot of people that are running this against their products want to keep their data um, proprietary as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what my perspective was also. Like, why would somebody just create those algorithms and make mature them and just leave them in <laughs> open? I mean, that's a lot of hard work. Yeah. So yeah. Well, when you think about hackers and just different things, right? So someone gets into those neural nets and those algorithms, they can change stuff. You know, there's just risk with when you're talking about the way that the machine learning works in the algorithms that you want to keep it safe. And, and if someone mistrains it or does something different, there is some work in that. So it's not as simple as just um, changing the code, right? So with code-based automation, you make a change to the code, bam, rerun it, and it runs. with um, training, it's very different, right? I think of training AI more like you think about us as humans and how we learn and how children learn as they grow up. It's a little bit more sensitive. It's not that you can't retrain, but it is a little more sensitive than just linear code where you just go, yep, make a change. Oh. It's good. Yeah, I would absolutely love to go on and on on this topic, but there are so many questions here, so I'm going to take them up quick and we're going to run out of time shortly. So the next question is, how can bot test a page without understanding different types of inputs it needs to support? And the same person has asked uh, two more questions, so I'm just going to add to it. Are we talking about both unit and functional testing? And will this eliminate need for unit testing? Um, it can do unit and functional. So we always say in organizations, the first question is, what challenge or problem are you trying to solve? So start first with your problem. Like, my, is your problem in unit testing? If you don't have a problem with unit testing and whatever you're currently using is working for you and it's not slowing you down and it's not causing a speed or scale issue, then you know don't try and fix problems that you don't have today. Where we tell people to start, at least start, that doesn't mean it's where you'll end, but start with your real pain points and your problem points, experimenting and using the new technologies that are available. So if your pain point is functional testing that's slowing you down, start with that and see, see where you can apply it. 
You can also apply it to unit. Um, but again, it's going to be a case-by-case uh, -case basis on where it makes the most sense to apply it. And then the other piece you asked, how can a bot do this if it doesn't know its data? So there are six steps that we talk about to train a bot. The first step is you give it access to either your APK for your mobile or you give it access to a website. It goes and it crawls that site and builds that app graph that Rick showed you earlier. So it's building that connection point to all the things in your site. So once it builds where all the things are, what it looks like, what the map looks like, all of that, then there's a process where you have to label what all those things are so that it knows, right? So that the bot knows that's a login button. It's gonna make guesses and it's pretty accurate usually depending on what type of site you have on a login button, a search button, all the basic things. It's gonna come back with labels and recommend some of those. Then after you have labels and you've made sure those look good, what you're doing is you can train it, right? So you give it the intent. You say, I want you to start here and end somewhere else. You don't have to write all the steps in the middle. You can say, start here, end here, and it's gonna tell you the ways that it gets there. Maybe not the way you would do it, but it'll tell you the ways it goes. You can make it more prescriptive. We don't recommend going super prescriptive because um, that's a more traditional approach, but you can. And then you can give it parameters. You can say, validate this, value within this range, or you can give it some validate parameters. So with all AI, as Rick and I mentioned, this isn't about you just let it run and you don't have any insight or input to it. This is a collaboration of humans and machine where it does some of that virtual assistant work and research, but you absolutely have, as the human, have to partake and weigh in on it. Rick, did I miss anything? Uh, the only piece that you missed was uh, as you input data, it starts to learn what values those fields require. And then it'll actually start making kind of a, it'll start noticing patterns in the values we should be entering. And it will start to guess values for us when new pages arise, things like that. Great. Uh, so in a way, we can say that maybe initially it may not make so much sense, but as uh, the time passes, as the lot of data passes happen, uh, probably it will the bot or the AI algorithm will start making more sense. Yeah, so over time, yeah. So we always say when you first in, when you first start leveraging this stuff, it's like it's almost like children. They start off as baby bots, then they become like toddlers, and then they become teenagers. So I look at this a little bit differently than any other technology we've seen in this space in that um, coded automation is static. It's point in time. It is what it is. It does what it does. But for AI, it has a neural net and it's learning as Rick said, so it actually can get more mature over time and it can learn and it gets smarter over time. So the sooner you start leveraging this technology in your environment and trying it out, the more data it's accumulating, the more learning it's doing, the smarter it's getting. So time to market, there will be a differentiator point where early adopters and companies who do this sooner see the results and the advantages much faster than other companies. That's why also executives are looking at this so critically. It could be a game changer in leaders and laggers in industries and companies. Great. Um, I'll quickly go over to the next question. So regarding the app graph visualization, it captures uh, the current system behavior. But what if there is a defect and it is wrong? Will the bot find that defect? Uh, if on the very first time when it's capturing the app graph, it has no baseline to refer back to. Um, and that's where mm -hmm. we, use, we use reinforcement learning to go back through and say, yes, everything you found is correct. Um, and if something is wrong, it will flag it and raise it up. Um, so for instance, if there's a if a page gets added and it now has to just click through an additional page, but it still completes the objective of the testing, it will then flag it as a past test case as in it achieved its objective, but the path it took would be a warning and flagged saying, I had to take an alternative path that I didn't know. And then we would have to go and say, is the app graph out of date? We have to update it or is that actually a defect and look at it? But we would know from a functionality perspective, it accomplished the task it was set out to do. The next question is, which tool are you using for game automation and how does it handle difference in browsers? Uh, it doesn't have any problem with browser. Um, it's really, um, we tend to just use Chrome because that's kind of what everybody uses right now. Um, but it can work in any browser. It's not, it doesn't matter because it's not actually using like a web hook to get in. It's actually interacting at the screen layer and simulating a human interaction. Next question is, 
Is AI effective with non-browser based applications? Does it work with the mainframe? Uh, yes, it will work with client-side apps as well as <clears throat> databases and things like that sort. Um, I haven't tried it on like an old tape-driven mainframe. Um, we just haven't had the opportunity. I'm sure it will. It can do green screen and terminal emulation, so that it will be able to interact with the actual interface. Um, but I don't know if it would be able to directly hit that those those like tape driven those old ones from the 60s. Um, that's a throwback, though. I don't know if any of those are still even operational. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's. Uh, I think that's probably a great good answer to this one. Um, can you give a snippet on how this can help or apply to performance testing? So when this one runs, it's actually doing performance metrics on every single step. So it gathers metrics the entire time, and it's not gathering just the load times. Um, it's actually grabbing CPU, the load time, hardware, throughput. It's grabbing everything it can while it's running because it has access, or it's just we it's it's hooked into everything, so it can do that. Um, and the difference in performance is it's actually not looking like um, uh, old Windrunner would actually wait for specific objects on the page to load. So you may get kind of faster times than you should have, or it'd be slightly off a little bit. These ones are actually looking at the entire screen to have the entire screen finish loading. Um, so this, it's a little bit of a different where it's more user-based, user interaction-based performance metrics. And it can do API tests and things like that too, where it's actually capturing the the timing from calls to responses. Um, but it's it's a little heavy of a tool for that. Um, can do it. It's just there's sometimes people already have a nice suite in place that we just say, hey, we'll just have the two work together, and we'll we'll use your JMeter or whatever you're running. The next question is: Is there AI that will firstly uh, generate or modify code itself? Uh, versus storing within the tool itself? And secondly, that will support backend testing like database. So the first one on code, yes. So there's actually a couple companies right now that are using tools that actually make um, changes to the code itself. So self-healing type things where it goes out and looks at if there's a problem and there's a fix that needs to be made, simplistic fixes they're using right now. That's a newer piece and it's being developed, um, but it is out there. We've seen two different organizations and companies that are leveraging tools to do that from the developer side and the code side. On the backend pieces, um, they're again, same thing. Where AI has been most um, prevalent to now, and just as a maturity standpoint, has been um, the UI layer, mobile web, um, those types of things, but the API layer and some of the tools to be able to do that, it absolutely can do that. There's tools that have that capability to do that out there and they're maturing. That's the lesser mature area of AI right now. Um, the more mature area is around functional unit, um, the front end UI, UX layers, those types of things. But it's um, starting to mature in the back end and the API layer piece as well. It absolutely does work. Um, we know a large hardware slash software company um, that we're able to do that with. But again, it's just about what is the pain point and does it make sense to do that or is it better to continue to use Selenium and some of the traditional open sources and is that a more effective tool to use? Like Rick always likes to tell me, sometimes you need the sledgehammer and sometimes you just need a baby hammer. So which hammer is the appropriate tool to use in that scenario? I would look at it and say, is AI the right use case for it or is your traditional Selenium the right use case? I'll go to the next question. I'll take this as the last question for now. So most of the AI that seems to be available works against uh, built components and UIs. Is there any AI technology that models uh, its testing on the product requirements, specifications, or source code? Oh, as long as, so here's what's interesting because it doesn't go after the code. So if you have mockups, wireframes, there's a lot of um, startup companies. So there's a large um, startup contingent so most of people like Google, um, 
SAP, others have startups that um, are starting to leverage AI technology, right? So you don't have to have the fully built code and the product and all of that to be able to leverage some of these tools because it's not going after that. You have to have something to visually verify. So if you have clickable wireframes, if you have other components, um, clickable requirements where you've built that out into a format that's on a screen that it can view and look at and click through and tell you when it's changed or you know what the differences are, it can work on clickable models as well, because it's again doing, some of them I should say can, not all, but um, verifying at that computer vision layer. Great, thank you Jennifer and Rick. Actually, there are so many questions still, and what we're going to do is email you those questions so you can respond and uh, we can share them with the attendees or put them as the blog so people can refer to your responses. Perfect. That sounds great. I appreciate everyone joining us today. And I put my, it's Jennifer at pinklion.ai. And then Rick is just Rick at pinklion.ai. Um, and you can find us there. We're happy to answer more questions and get you guys information, but we appreciate you guys joining us today. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Rick. So uh, again, it was very in, uh, insightful session and I'm sure our attendees uh, found it very informative and useful too. So I hope to see you both at STPCon soon. Yeah, see everyone at STPCon. Make sure everyone's there. It'll be a great time. Thank you. Well, everyone, this concludes our webinar for today. So thank you for joining. And more importantly, thanks for being so engaging and making the most of the webinar for yourself and for the whole group. And if you want to see more such sessions from Jennifer and wish to learn more about testing, do join us at STPCon Spring 2020. Like we said, that the complete program is there on the site for you to choose from. And uh, do not forget to grab your discount on early bird tickets, which will be on sale only until February 14th, which is just two more days. And at any point, should you have queries on registrations, do email them to info at softwaretestpro.com. And also let me remind you, the call for submissions for the webinars for this year is now open and will be open all year round. Please do send in your proposals ASAP to pick the slots of your choice. And stay tuned for more webinars at softwaretestpro.com. We have an upcoming webinar, which is how to rebuild trust in your test automation on the 26th of this month. In this webinar, uh, the speaker, Hima Bindu, She's going to focus on understanding how can we uh, start trust, uh, trusting our automated tests again and explore what you can do to repair the situation or even better prevent the breaking up of uh, trust from happening in the first place. If the subject interests you, please do sign up for the same at softwaretestpro.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week ahead. See you all in San Diego in March this year. And keep practicing your testing skills. Thank you.